So we want to do that. Why don't we stand and we're going to open in prayer and we're going to get right into this word today. Say, Heavenly Father, Father, speak to my heart, heart, change my life life, by your spirit and with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this week I wanted to talk about discipleship. The title of my message is simply Discipleship 101. And I just want to talk about what it means to be a disciple. And I think what God intends uh, from us as his children is that God wants us to be a disciple. A disciple is a devoted learner or a devoted follower. Okay, And the whole call of the New Testament church as New Testament Christians is that we're called to be disciples and we're called to make disciples. All right, We're called to be disciples, but we're also called to make disciples. And uh, we hear the term Christian. How many hear the, the term Christian a lot, right? We hear the term Christian, but it's only used three times in the New Testament. Did you know that? So say, I'm a Christian. But you know, that term was only used three times. Actually, the term believer was used 26 times. um, But the term disciple is used 260 times in the New Testament. And this is significant. So we need to be telling people, hey, I'm a disciple of Christ. Yes, you're a Christian, which means a Christ follower. But we are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. A disciple is always identified with their teacher. Okay? And uh, the world revolved around their teacher. Okay, and so when you're a disciple of someone, then you re- everything revolves around becoming like that person. Okay, and Luke chapter six, uh, verse forty, it says, "A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained, say fully trained, will be like his teacher." See, God wants us to be like Jesus. He's the carbon copy. So our goal in life as a disciple is to become like Christ by hanging out with Christ, by reading his words, right? We go through the scripture and we want to live like Jesus and we want to share his love. That's why that's our mission statement as a church. Simple mission statement. Live like Jesus and share his love. We want to become a carbon copy of Jesus Christ. Do you want to become a carbon copy? Let me see. This is our goal. And, and, and many times it's, it's like people are trying to be a carbon copy of some preacher or some denomination. Or, but we want to become a carbon copy of Christ. That's our goal. In 1 John, uh, verse, chapter, chapter 2, verse 6 says, Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And so this is our goal as believers is to live like Jesus and to share his love. Next slide. Okay, here's the key thought I want to bring. Number one, living like Jesus publicly starts with living like him privately. Right? Character is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. And so we can all go to church and put on a smiley face and lift our hands and sing. But what does our life look like during the week? God wants us to live like Jesus privately so that we can live like him publicly. That's the way it goes. Okay? So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we need to get away and get alone with God. Get away and get alone with God. And you have to do both, because sometimes you can get away, but how many know you're not alone? You get away from the busyness of life, but then, but then you're busy with uh, texts and emails and phone calls and talking with people, and you're supposed to be spending time with God. So you're getting away from your schedule, but you're not getting alone. Amen? And you need to do both things together. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, we see what Jesus did. But Jesus often, say often, withdrew. Jesus did it not, he didn't do it just once in a while. He did it often. How many more, if we want to be like Jesus, we need to do what Jesus did. And he uh, he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Okay? And so, we must make time with God a priority. If we want to be disciples. Jesus often withdrew, next slide, okay, to a lonely place and prayed. And, and we do the prayer thing. How many know we do the prayer thing? We, we get up and we pray. And, you know, we have a prayer life. We should, as believers, we have a prayer life. Um, but we miss step two. And here's step two, lonely places. There's something about being alone. There's, there's something about, I have to have quiet time with God, and I have to be alone. I have to be in a lonely place. That means there's no one else around. Even my own thoughts have to be quiet, and I have to be still before the Lord and know that He is God. 
And unfortunately, we live in a society that is busy, 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 busy all the time. And we pray, but we don't really connect with God because we're not lonely. And I, I want to say this more. As I was preparing this, God was saying, my people need to make some white space in their life. There has to be time in the day, even specifically in the morning is the best time, to get up and say, this is blank space. This is time for me to be alone with God. And you know what? I, when I preach, I use electronic devices and stuff. But I do, at home, I have a paper Bible. I have an old school Bible. Do you know why? So that I can have some lonely space. Because when I use my, my Bible app and I sit there and I start reading the Bible, all of a sudden, oh, there's a notification. Someone's texting me. Oh, someone's, oh, okay. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not focusing in, in the lonely place, in the blank space. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I think that that, that robs us uh, when we don't have blank space or lonely space with God. We don't hear God and, and, and we don't have direction for our lives. Okay? We, we're busy. You know what busy means? Being under Satan's yoke. Busy, busy, busy. And so our thoughts are constantly going, constantly going. And we need some white space. Say white space. white space. We need some time just to be quiet and know that God is God. Okay? The Bible tells us we're to strive to enter into that rest. And so many times I have to strive to get away from the busyness of my thoughts and the busyness of being a dad and the busyness of being a pastor just to say, hey, I need some quiet space. i got to strive just to rest in this place where, where I can hear God, where I can be in this lonely place or boring place. Can you say boring? See, boring is a good thing, because creativity is, is birthed in boring times, right? And um, there's been many events. Go to the next slide here. Okay, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And I just felt as I was preparing this that God is saying that my people are praying, but they need to do a, just make a slight adjustment and say, I'm going to make some white space. I'm going to make a solitary place. I'm going to make a place where I can be still and even still my thoughts and hear what God is saying. And this is important because God is a creator and we've been made in his image. And because we're made in his image, there's a creative part of us that will never function with the busyness of life. We need to be in a solitary place. Because creativity is born in quiet times, in boring times. You know, over the summer, there was a, a week or so where I had no plans for my kids. And they were just having to find their own entertainment. And I was busy going to work. And at the end of the week, I come home. And Jonas has built this fort in a tree. And I went out and looked at this, and he's got a board going up here and a, a, a board going across here, and he's got a swing that's swinging in front of these sharp stakes. You know, he's swinging over these sharp pieces of wood out of the ground, and he's got all these little platforms, and he's, he's found all different types of nails and screws and hammers. He's killed the tree, by the way. It's dead, but he's built a fort because in boredom comes creativity, right? And, and I, I find that, you know, we went to Cuba just a few weeks ago, and uh, I was trying to work it out so somebody could come with me so I'd have someone in my room. You know, we have two beds and I have someone to chat with and hang out with. It didn't work out that way, so I got my own room and I was bored. So I put the TV on. It's all in Spanish. I said, what am I going to do? So I'm going to just read my Bible and pray and talk to God. And I ended up, you know, outside the time of ministry we did, when I was in my room, I just spent time with God, and God began to speak to me and give me vision for the church and gave me creative ideas for what we could do in Cuba and creative ideas for, you know, for, for my family. And all these ideas started to flow because, you know, there was no internet. There's no, you, have to go to the, you have to go up to the cafe to get internet, so I had no internet. So I had no distractions. I was in boring spaces. And it's in that place that creativity is born. Amen? Let's go to the next slide here. Here's another thought. Jesus was about his father's business, and so should we. All right? Now, I've got a whole bunch of notes here that I never had before, so I'm just... Yeah. See, the Bible talks, uh, talks about... There's this word in, in Psalms called sila. Uh, how many have seen that? And it's kind of that little word that's in between paragraphs. It actually means stop and think about this. Ponder what's being said here in the moment. There's, there's something about, about taking time, time to seek out and marinate in God's word and see what he wants to say to you in the moment. 
We can read the Bible so quick, and we have to take that, that time to just marinate and let God's Word talk to us. In Proverbs 2, verse 4, it says, If you seek for her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, uh, you will find the wisdom of God. Have you ever seen someone search for, for treasure with a shovel and just go, you know, they're just, just throwing the dirt and they're not paying any attention? No, they, they take it and they take a little bit and they siphon it through a little machine to see if there's any gold or any silver. In there and, they take the, and they look through every grain of dirt. They're seeking carefully. And we got to study the word of God like that. You take the word and you study it and you look, what is it saying? What does this word mean? How does this apply to my life? And you slow down and you say, God, talk to me. And you marinate and let it begin to transform you. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so we got to search the scripture like we're searching for treasure. Well, I just believe this, and I read it this way because this is the way my grandfather believed it, and we always went to this church, and we don't believe healings for today, and this and that, so that's just what I... No, stop and go through the word like it's hidden treasure and see what God wants to say to you. Amen? All right, so let's go to the second thought here. Um, Jesus was about his father's business and so we should be as well. In Luke chapter 2, verse 49 to 50, he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. They didn't understand what he was trying to say. Okay? Um, what, what is the father's business? Well, the first thing he wants to do is he wants to reach the lost. Say, so reach the lost. In Luke chapter 5, 29 to 32, it says, And then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus in his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors um, and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their uh, sect complained to the disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. This is what, what, uh, what God, God's heart is. And I don't know about you, but I've been a Christian for many, many years, and I've, I have never, um, I've never had um, a sermon preached to me or, or a discipleship program that I've taken that encouraged me to invite non-Christians over for dinner and hang out with them. This is Jesus. This is discipleship 101. Find as many people that everyone else thinks are dirty and uh, you know have sin issues and got problems in their life. Invite them over for dinner and hang out with them and just love on them. This is how Jesus does evangelism. And maybe if we take time in in the quiet with with quiet spaces with a blank page to say, God, give me some creative ideas to reach my neighborhood. He might start to talk to you about your neighbors and how you can reach them. It might be something simple, like inviting them or making them a pie or doing something. But in those creative spaces, when we have blank spaces, we become creative. Amen? God can start to talk to us. And his first priority is that we go out and we reach the ones who are sick spiritually that need God, and we love on them. Amen? And... It's so important to God that there's actually a level of self-care required once you're a believer. Did you know that? Right? We come to church and it's good. We come to church because we want to grow and we want to develop. It's like the, the, the Bible says it's a place for building up and edifying and growing and to care for. So church is important. Say church is important. But, but there, there is, there's a self-care required. And here, here's, here's what Jesus says in Matthew um, Chapter 18, verse 12 to 13, talking about God's heart. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out and search for the one that is lost? All right? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that did not wander away. That's almost unfair. It's like, God, you, what about the 99? You're going to leave 99 sheep to themselves, and you're going to go and look for one sheep, and when you find that sheep, you're going to rejoice more than you will over the night. What is, what's going on? Well, God has given us one another, right? The Bible says we're to love one another. We're to take care of one another's burdens. We're supposed to care for one another. So we're supposed to become a family to, to, to protect one another. And he wants us to love one another, right? And he's given us this Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. And now he's, I'm busy. I'm going to work. And if you want to be where God is, go to work, Right? 
Go after those who are lost, and you'll be in the very presence of God. The next one is, the Father wants us to build the found. Once people are saved and come into the kingdom, he wants us to build them. All right? In Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15, it says, Jesus went up on a mountaintop, and he called to him uh, those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve, designated them apostles that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Okay? And so Jesus appointed twelve. I want you to know this today, that Jesus has appointed you. He has called you to bear fruit, right? We're not called to be spectators. We're called to go out with a gospel message and to share our testimony and share our faith. Amen? So God has called us to do this. He's appointed us. Say, he's appointed me. He's anointed me. And he sent me forth. All right? So we are called. We have the very calling that Jesus had to go after the lost sheep, okay? So here's, um, here's the, third, the third thought. True disciples of Jesus will do radical things. Okay? Go to the next slide. Yeah. A true disciple of Jesus will do radical things. Here's, here's a really, the um, Bible says, great, great crowds were following Jesus, and he turned around and said to them, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Okay? And you cannot be my disciple if you don't carry your own cross and follow me. Okay? But don't begin until you count the cost. And this is what Jesus was telling his followers. Right? He was saying, you, see, if you're going to be a carbon copy of Jesus, you've got to love the Father more than you love your own family. That, that's a, a, a depth of love that only the Holy Spirit can do in you. Okay? And what Jesus was sharing to the people. He loved people so much that we see that he would touch lepers. He was willing to go and touch the lepers because leprosy was an incurable disease. If you touched it, you got it, right? And Jesus cared so much that he wanted to touch them. In Mark chapter 1, verse 40 and 42, we see a scripture here. It says, A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, If you're willing, can you make me clean? And the Bible says, Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, and immediately the leprosy left him. And he was cured. See, Jesus was motivated by compassion. And so if we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, the most important thing is that we're motivated by compassion. All right? And so our motivation needs to be compassion as well. The Greek word for compassion means to have a deep and tender mercy to be moved to action. And there's something that happens as we... Um, as we discover who we are in Christ as we understand our identity in God. We, there's a love that's birthed in us for the lost. How many hear what I'm saying? And, and, and honey draws more bees than vinegar. I learned this over the years. If you come with the, the gospel of hope and the gospel of love, people are drawn to that. If you come just with judgment and the Bible says this and you're a sinner and you have come that kind of way, it, you're not going to draw anybody to Christ. And so we need to be driven by compassion. It has to be compassion that moves us. Okay? How many remember the story in Matthew chapter 18 about the master of the servant? Uh, and the servant owed the master a million dollars, and he, and he couldn't repay it. How many remember that, that parable? The Bible says that he came to the master, and he complained and said, Master, I don't have the money. And, and, and the Bible says the master was moved with compassion. And he released him and forgave him of the debt. That word compassion actually comes from the Greek word, uh, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, but it's G4697. It means to have the bowels yearn. Okay, the actual interpretation is the intestines yearn. That is to feel sympathy in the gut. You ever had um, where you have such a compassion, it's right in your stomach. You experience that with... Maybe your own children, your own family, if something tragic happens, there's just a yearning inside. It's a deep, deep feeling of compassion. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, That's what this word means. And this is how God feels about the lost. This is how God feels about us if we're going through tough times or dealing with infirmity. There's a yearning in him, a compassion that moves 
it moves inside of him. Okay, that's how God feels. And then we see in Matthew eighteen thirty three that um, we understand that the the person who was forgiven by the master goes out and he refuses to forgive someone who owes him money. You guys remember the parable, right? And this is what the the master says, you sh- should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I have had pity on you? That word compassion is a different word. It actually means to have mercy or show mercy. It's a choice. How many see that? Anytime in the New Testament where God says, have compassion, he's, and he's talking to us, he says, show pity. Make a choice to show mercy. But when Jesus is talking in the Gospels, it's a different word, compassion. It's a feeling of emotion that moved him to ministry. And I want to say this. Once we become believers, and once we spend time in the presence of God, that same spirit comes upon us, and we begin to have a a, a compassion that moves us into action. How, How many hear what I'm saying? So we move from a compassion that is just a choice, where the Bible says, I should love you, so you know what, I'm going to love you. It turns into, I can't help but love you. I'm being moved to it. And God wants us to be a people, as we grow in him, ministry becomes an outflow of our love, and there's no longer a work. How many hear what I'm saying? And so as we're discipling, and as we're we're being discipled and growing in Christ, we begin to flow in ministry out of compassion, not out of duty or out of works. And that's what shows that we're maturing in God. There's an overwhelming feeling to move and do the work of God instead of a choice. In sharing our faith, once you have compassion, we'll look at one more verse. First Peter 3, verse 15 and 16 says this. I don't know if I have that verse. It says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and in a respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Right? This is, share our faith with gentleness and with respect. You know, I've always been an evangelist at heart. and I, There was times, I remember, up until even a few years ago, where there was still a little bit of a root of rejection in me i didn't i don't like being rejected and when i'd be sharing my faith or sharing the scripture and people um would disagree i I would argue with them and i would actually get angry how many have ever got angry when you're witnessing well the bible says and you know and yeah but i don't believe that well you you need to believe that and and i'd literally get worked up because I, did, I didn't want to be rejected but you know what you get to a place where the compassion of god overwhelms you and now it's just like hey you know what, I'm going to pray for you. This is what I believe. It'll transform your life. Well, I don't believe that. I think you're crazy. That's okay, but you know, I'm still going to pray. And you just don't get bothered anymore. How many hear what I'm saying? Right? Because now it's, you're not ministering with rejection. You're ministering out of compassion. And this is where God wants to move us as disciples. All right? Jesus was a friend of sinners. He'd be fran- he, he was always hanging out with sinners. And... Um, Jesus often offended the Pharisees. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you're going to offend religious people. All right? People that, it's all about the rules. It's not about the heart. The next thought, thought number four, a true disciple of Jesus will fish for the lost effectively. And I think I've missed that one here. And, the last, and here we got here, a true disciple of Jesus will serve willingly. This is important. Matthew 23, 11 to 12. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. There's three questions we need to ask ourselves as a disciple. Go to the next slide. And these are the three questions. What is your motivation? Okay. What is your motivation for, sh- for, for sharing? What, what, what is it that's motivating you? To, is, it, is it compassion? Do you care? Okay. The second thing is, what is the need in front of you? Is there, is there a need that I can meet? Okay. And, and what do you have to give? And I just feel the Spirit of God moving on me right now. That I think there's a need we can meet in this church right now. Um, how many know Mary? 
who had her liver transplant, and Darcy. And if you don't know the story, she needed a liver transplant, um, and they couldn't find one, and she needed one quickly. And her husband went in for a checkup, and he actually was a match. So he gave 70% of his liver to her. So they're both recovering. He can't work, right? Um, and then just before that, he cut his fingers off on a bandsaw. Had to get them all sewed back on. They don't work properly. Um, so they're going through tough times, and he's, he's trying to get a job right now. Christmas is coming up. And now she's got this liver transplant. He's, his, his liver's regrowing because it grows back, which, praise God. But she's got his liver, and uh, she has to take a medication every day. And what is it called? It's called a anti-rejection medication, and it's very expensive. And I know right now that they don't have the money for medication for this month. And her daughter called me, and she, I don't know if she's here today, but she called and she said, I don't know what to do. My mom and my dad, they don't have money for medication. It's Christmas and all this. And I want to, as a church, just we're going to take up an offering for her to pay for her medication. And God might speak to you and say, hey, give five bucks, give a toonie. He might say, give a hundred bucks. I don't know what it is, but there's a, there's a need right in front of us. And uh, I just really feel like we need to meet this. Because this is like a life and death need. This is like, if she doesn't get her medication, you know, that's a serious thing. So, Father, we just come before you right now. And we just ask that you would um, just lead us in our, in, our, in our giving right now, God. Um, speak to our hearts what you would have us just so into them. Like, he doesn't have a job right now. And, you know... They have no source right now of income. But, Lord, we, would, we want to help them at least cover their medication. So, Lord, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I finish the message, you guys can um, you know, bring up an offering here. Put on the envelope, benevolence, so I, that it goes right to them. Or you can put, yeah, you put Mary, put her name on there. And if you're using the debit machine, you can do it in the debit as well. But I just really feel, is that okay if we do that today? Let's take care of that. We want to, as a church, we want to, we want to take care of her. Okay, um, so what is the need in front of you? And the second thing is, what do you have to give? And how can we help, okay? I like what Jesus said here in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and I'm going to close in just a minute. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to give, he's a servant. And you know, it's funny, if you go to chapters, right, you see all these books on leadership, how many, you go to this, section, this whole leadership section of books, how to be a better leader, how to be a better you, all this stuff. But I don't see any books on followership. They should have a followership section in the, in the, in the Christian section, right? Say, this is the followership section. Because, you know, if we learn to follow Christ, guess what? We're going to be leaders because Jesus was, he was a servant before he was a leader, right? And so we want to be great followers of Jesus. Last point here, key thought, verse 6. Or number six, a true disciple genuinely cares for their spiritual family. And these are the things the Bible um, asks us to do. I'm just going to go to the next point. I'm going to run them off. Number one, love one another. Slowly. Love, love one another. Be devoted to one another. Okay? Honor one another. Accept one another. Serve one another in love. Right? Moved by compassion. This is, what, this, is what, this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Next verse, or, or next slide. Be compassionate to one another. Submit to one another. Okay? Encourage one another. Live in harmony with one another. And offer hospitality to one another. Right? And this is what God is asking for, from us. As we're disciples and we're becoming more and more a carbon copy of Christ... We're going to begin to do these things. And it becomes less and less about us, and it becomes more and more about other people. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is the secret to ministry, right? And, and I'm not talking about fivefold ministry. I'm talking about ministry for God. As we care for God's kingdom, which is other people, and we share the love of God with other people, and we do these eight things, what happens is the blessing, you begin to reap it in your own life, finances, health, Joy, all this stuff begins to come into your life. And you begin to say, man, I'm blessed. 
And it's, I don't even have to run around and name it and claim it and confess it and all that. You don't even have to do that because it's just an outflow. It's you, you receive the harvest of what you're giving. Does that make sense? And so God is calling us to that. Last uh, verse here, John 13, 34 to 35. It says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to just end there today. Why don't we stand and pray? Amen. Father, I thank you for every person present here today, God. I thank you that we're disciples of Christ. And Lord, we, we want to follow you. We want to follow the way you live your life. We want to love people the way you love people. We want to have compassion the way you have compassion. But ultimately, it's, it's a work of your spirit in us. So God, we just, we thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to us this week. And even as we go home this week, that we're going to make, make a slight adjustment so we have more white space, that so we have more lonely times, so that we can hear the voice of God more clearly. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.